good afternoon. My name is Kit Cavello of Hard Lens Media, and today we are joined here with LaShawn Latrice. Uh, we are filming here at the Q4 radio station. You can listen to Hard Lens Media every Saturday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. And LaShawn is also a member of Black Lives Matter Women of Faith. And so essentially, let's get started in regards to Black Lives Matter. So again, thank you so much for joining Hard Lens Media, LaShawn. So in regards to corporate media, the name Black Lives Matter has been used as a way to show hostility towards police and the political establishment. Now, this narrative ignores why this group was formed in the first place. So for our viewers, what is the purpose of Black Lives Matter and what is the purpose of your group, Black Lives Matter Women of Faith? The purpose of Black Lives Matter, thank you for having me. The purpose of Black Lives Matter, um, it's a movement that was formed a few years ago with the wake of uh, Trayvon Martin being killed. Mm -hmm. um, people around the country was outraged um, because it was a situation where we felt like we were intentionally targeted. That outrage turned into, um, let's form something, let's marginalize, let's get ourselves together and galvanize. And so they took that negative and they turned it into something positive. And they decided to come up with a movement called Black Lives Matter. It means so many different things to so many different people, but what we are not, we don't represent terrorist acts. We don't represent anything negative. What we represent is we are standing up for our lives because our lives matter. Now, when we came up with our organization, myself and my founder, Carolyn J. Ruff, Black Lives Matter Women of Faith was just what it says. It is a group of women who have come together and said, we have faith to know that things can change and our lives do matter as black people. And now, of course, let's just understand the, the purpose uh, of, of another issue that has happened recently, and you could perhaps give more depth and detail about the situation, but there was a Maisha boycott in Chicago a while back, and one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter Women Faith, one of the main co-founders, Carolyn J. Ruff, was arrested, but was also prohibited from like participating in further boycotts. And on your group's Facebook page, it states that the charges were dismissed, but she faced additional charges. So for our viewers, how did it start with the Misha boycott, and what led up to the additional charges? So with uh, the Misha boycott, uh, it is a store called Misha Beauty Supply Store. On March 9th, uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, a black woman was abused uh, by the manager and his wife. She was accused of stealing eyelashes. Um, it was videoed by another patron in the store, and that video began to uh, circulate, and it gained worldwide attention. When it made it to Carolyn, Carolyn decided to uh, call me and talk about it, and we decided that we would stand in solidarity with the store in Charlotte, North Carolina, who is also owned by the same owner. So we started our boycott a few days later. Um, it's been going now for 246 days, and it is still currently going. They have removed the name off the store. Carolyn, who is the founder of Black Lives Matter Women of Faith, was arrested. Uh, one day by herself when she was out there. Um, she hadn't even made it to the store, but one of the employees had filed false charges to say she did something wrong to him, like threatened him or something. She didn't even know that these charges were out there. And before she could get out of her car, she was arrested by the police. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we went to court for that. She hired an attorney, did all that. She got those charges dismissed. Then that same employee went again and filed another set of charges on top of that while that was pending. So that made her now have to go to court again. So she's had a total of three charges uh, filed against her, and to date, all three of them have been since dismissed. Well, that's uh, very good to hear. So in regards to this, uh, what has been the reaction of the community towards a boycott? And secondly, what has been the response of local elected community leaders? So that's a good question. Um, we received major support from the community. We stand out there, we pass out literature, we educate people on why we're standing there, and we really want to shut Misha down. The reason why is because we feel like there should be a store there that is investing in the community, not taking our dollars and being disrespectful to us, but actually contributing to making the community a better place to live. So our entire goal has always been is to educate the community because we want what's best for the community. So people join us, people from the community, they deliver food, they bring money, they bring water, whatever they feel like they can do to contribute if they don't come and stand out with us. And what we do in turn, we pass out literature. We have signs that we pass out which talks about the boycott, but it also directs people to other businesses 
that actually invest in the community. We also pass these flyers out, which tell the people what time they can join us for the boycott. Mm -hmm. And we've received a tremendous response because we keep it on social media. And not only is it on social media, but other people have kind of picked it up and they've sent the message out to tell people to come and join us. So a lot of organizations have come out and joined us as well. As far as um, the political aff affiliates in, in the community, we can't really say we received a lot of support from them. I know that um, Carolyn has recently spoken at uh, City Council, but she has been requesting a meeting from the Alderman, Alderwoman uh, Sophie King. Mm -hmm. And she has not been very successful until she did the speech at City Council where she talked about her experience of being arrested mm -hmm. and abused. She had hot coffee thrown on her. She's had water, a dog sicked on her, a bat pulled on her, and she's been punched in the stomach. And she's 70 years old. She still has the resilience to come out there every day and still boycott with all those things happening to her. And she really cares about the community so much that she's, it's worth her sacrificing her life and her freedom for it, and I love that about her. So what's been happening now is ever since she got up and talked at the city council hearing, mm -hmm. now um, Sophie King's office has reached out to her to say that they would uh, have a meeting with her. And so oh, okay. hopefully that meeting is going on today, and hopefully something good comes out of it. And I'm looking forward to um, building a relationship because, as you know, if the aldermen stand up with us, we will receive much more support from what's happening with that store because it's really an eyesore in the community. It has a number of building code violations in addition to being very mean and disrespectful to the people that come inside and patronize. And because some of us feel like that's our only source to go to, people patronize the store regardless. Now, it's imperative to note this might be a little bit uh, deviating away, but today is November 18th, so so Sophie King is actually speaking to Carolyn right now, and there will probably be a follow through in regards to what happens with that meeting, and uh, we're hoping that we can actually uh, find out what happens and it, whether or not any other city or elected officials actually talk to your group or other grassroots activists in regards to what's happening to a lot of the low-income minority communities as well as the brutality that was uh, you know put upon Carolyn. You know, so we are hoping for that um, and definitely give, doing a real follow-through. <clears throat> now, in regards to our state and the city we live in, Chicago, it has a long history of segregation and discrimination towards people of color and communities of color. Now, what has been your organization's uh, response uh, to the challenge, to the barriers that have been in place here for many, many years? Well, we believe that we must stand up to those challenges. We must stand up to those barriers um, that exist in our communities. Before we were ever at Misha, we were always in the communities, those disenfran disenfranchised neighborhoods. We were in the places where people didn't really want to go. We were passing out literature to our community, letting them know how they can be empowered and they can use their voice for good. Mm -hmm. We were also talking to them about registering a vote so that they can be part of the change that needs to be made and letting them know that their lives matter. And not only that, but the, each neighborhood is, is a very important component of the city of Chicago. So we think it's very important to reach out to the communities that people feel like are left behind or they're so desolate that they don't warrant a discussion. There should always be room for discussion no matter where people live, whatever their socioeconomic background is, it shouldn't matter. Have you noticed an increase of people wanting to become actively involved in like your group, Black Lives Matter, Women of Faith, or other grassroots groups that want to uh, institute social change? Yes, um, and that's a good thing we love. We love the fact that when people see us out, they're always asking, how can I be a part of the organization? What is it that you all need? Where do you meet? Uh, can I come to your meetings? And we welcome everyone. We, it doesn't matter what your nationality is. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity, your background, your religious preference, your sexuality. We welcome men, women, children. Um, our organization is titled Black Lives Matter, Women of Faith, but we actually stand for collaboration. All right. Now, in regards to a situation that we're all dealing with right now, the aftermath of the 2016 presidential election cycle. It has led to an increase of people wanting to become politically involved and end the clear corruption uh, and that is crippling any type of real reform. So what have been the challenges that your organization has faced in regards to getting help from, let's say, local or state officials in regards to dealing with issues that are affecting a lot of minority communities, such as gentrification, police brutality, uh, the investment in the community? We have not received a lot of support from uh, the political 
world, so right. to speak, uh, when it comes to things like gentrification, right. impoverished communities, education, the lack of quality education, we haven't received a lot of support. Um, we have definitely stood up in the last few weeks. We've stood up for, um, we're, we're against Amazon coming to Chicago, so we still would answer Chicago because we know that that will continue to perpetuate gentrification. And we know that most of those jobs will not benefit the people in the community. So we are standing with Answer Chicago with that. We have uh, reached out to the mayor on several occasions. We've actually reached out to Kim Fox, who took Anita Alvarez's place. And actually, she campaigned on Laquan McDonald. Right. So we're now attending those court hearings for Jason Van Dyke to make sure that the voice of Laquan McDonald is constantly heard and that it's not forgotten. Um, we feel like Kim Fox has to uphold her end of the bargain when she campaigned and said she would make sure that all the corrupt uh, police officers and the law enforcement that have inflicted this kind of punishment on not only Laquan McDonald, but several hundred people have been abused and killed by Chicago police. And we've just seen recently, they've just been releasing a number of inmates who were uh, wrongfully convicted and need to confess, and they're now being released. So now we're, ho we're hoping that this uh, same energy uh, transfers over and it, it vindicates um, Laquan McDonald, and it actually uh, holds these police officers accountable that are now um, going to court for these improprieties that they've done to cost this young man his life. 16 shots being, being shot 16 times is, is absurd, mm -hmm. and there's no way that a person should have to die, there's no way that people should have to hear that their loved one died. So we're all for holding up elected officials accountable. And right now, it's a thin line between them holding up their end of the bargain and actually listening to the people, but they do not come out and talk to us at all. I understand. Thank you. Um, now, in regards to Mayor Emanuel, let's return to him and his administration. There's been a lot of criticism towards Mayor Emanuel and City Hall in regards to police brutality and corruption. We have seen firsthand of black sites in which people have been imprisoned and tortured. There is also now an increase in lawsuits in which the victims of police brutality are winning against the Chicago Police Department in regards to corrupt police officials harassing people and falsely putting evidence on them, most notably the 15 individuals who were exonerated yesterday and uh, uh, finally brought charges towards the, the, the police officers who were uh, putting ev false evidence and false charges on them. So uh, in regards to this, uh, what has been your organization's response to police corruption and brutality and what is needed from the city government to address the long history of corruption and police brutality that's gone basically um, unnoticed? Our organization, uh, Black Lives Matter Women of Faith, we, we are going to continue to bring awareness to the communities and we're going to get people out and mobilize them to let them know that we have to stand up and let our voices be heard for these officers that are committing these acts. I mean, they're heinous acts. These things that they're doing to people, they've been doing it and getting away with it for years. But right now, since there is a, a light shining on it, this is a perfect opportunity for people to use their voices who have been victims of police crimes to speak up. As I was talking to Mark Clements, he's been definitely very vocal in this fight uh, to get these officers held accountable. The 15 young men that were released, um, that one officer attached, but there are three more officers who have a few hundred other victims in prison right now for wrongful convictions because they've been abused and tortured. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now we're going to continue to stand with these organizations um, and hold these elected officials accountable because until they hold the officers accountable, this is going to continue to get worse. Now, there is always the history of people not trusting the police, especially in a lot of low-income minority communities where it's been established that the police presence there doesn't care or is actually contributing to the corruption and violence. So what is really necessary in your mind and your and with your organization as well to really bring proper policing into low-income minority communities? What is the necessary steps to rebuild trust between the people and the local police departments here? I believe the first step in rebuilding trust is going to be centered around holding those who have already committed crimes accountable. Right now, um, as community members, we're not safe um, if we can't trust the people that are paid to serve and protect. Mm -hmm. And I think they think more about the concept of serving than they do about protecting. So for us, we don't feel comfortable in our own communities. I grew up in Inglewood. It was a community where, as a little girl, 
I watched officers do all kind of things to people who had not even done anything wrong, but it was just the concept that they were an officer and that they, their culture existed where they felt like they could do whatever they wanted to without any accountability. So I'm kind of glad for the cell phones and the body cams and ways that now we can actually see what's happening because as we told these stories growing up, people really didn't believe that it was true unless you were actually there in the community. But in order to build that trust, we're going to have to see these officers actually pay for the crimes that they commit. And that will start restoring people where they're starting to say, okay, I can now trust you because now this elected official has put a measure in place. But they're going to have to do something with the way that these officers are regulated because once um, these police boards come in, the, of course that's elected by the mayor, that actually regulate the police and the unions, they're not being held accountable and those people work with them. And so you know how that goes. There's not going to be justice when their own friends are sitting on those boards. So we need a public board. We need citizens that will actually regulate when police are being accused of these crimes. Now, corporate media likes to show Chicago in the negative light in regards to the violence that happens in this city. And I think the one thing that corporate media fails to acknowledge is that there's a lot more to it in regards to the economic political and social situations that are in our city. So what are the real necessary steps for real uh, you know, community organi organizing to end the violence? And how do we really uh, break that narration of Chicago's a violent city? How do we end the violence here in this city? I would like to talk about the violence in the city or how it's perpetuated by the media. We know that it's centralized violence. We know that even though we know that systemic racism and systemic violence has been a component that has existed for decades in this city, it is not what's indicative of what represents Chicago. I feel like they want to put a level of fear out there for people, and that's what the corporate media does. But right now, it's too many people that are engaged that want to be a part of something. And I think once we take ownership, and we know that we, we can take ownership and not be held accountable, more people will step up to the plate to actually hold their community members and their aldermen accountable for what happens in the city. So I think we have to collaborate, and I think all these grassroots organizations can stand to come together, and whatever differences they may have, they, they are not going to be greater than us becoming one voice, and that voice is what's going to impact the larger audience. Now, we do know that in 2018, there will be a midterm election cycle, and there is going to be a lot of uh, talk and debates. We're going to see it on television, on the radio, on the internet. So what are the issue, issues you want to see from candidates that are running at the state and federal level? Uh, what do you want to see them talk about in their campaigns? And what concerns do you have as we reach for the 2019 mayoral run as well as the 2020 presidential election cycle? One thing I would love to see the politicians or candidates talk about what's going on in the communities. I want to, I want to hear about the, the violence, how that violence will be um, dealt with. How will the lack of education or quality education, um, who's going to address the schools and the budgets for the schools and the fact that they keep trying to close more and more schools and they're putting more kids in one class. I think that's a major issue. The lack of employment opportunities and the lack of resources in the community, especially in disenfranchised communities, that's a big issue. And if politicians want to get elected, and they want to show that they really care about the community, they're going to deal with these issues like this. We're going to talk about how guns are brought in the community. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about how drugs are brought into the community. And we're going to make a pathway to hold these people accountable that actually bring this stuff so that it can affect a certain group of people. Because you notice that when things like this happen, it's only centralized in certain communities, which is why they say Chicago is a dangerous city. Now, returning back to this question, uh, what do you want to see from the 2019 mayoral run? There's talk of five potential candidates uh, running against Mayor Rahm Emanuel. It's quite clear that there's people who uh, have a lack of confidence and trust with Mayor Emanuel and his administration, as well as his policies that he has implemented here in Chicago for the past eight years. Yes, and they're well within his, in their rights to have that type of lack of trust because um, as a mayor, you usually represent all of the people, not a portion of the people. And I do believe that the mayor, uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel, he represents a profitary motive. Um, I believe he also represents self-serving ideas. And I think anything that he pushes, any agendas that he pushes, is usually something that's going to end up benefiting him. I don't think he uh, is a voice for all the people, and I don't think he's tried to be a voice for all the people. 
he seems to be, be very focused on talking to people that only can benefit him and his campaign. And we saw with the release of the Laquan McDonald video, uh, the McDonald video, that he held that video intentionally so that it would not affect his his getting elected. And that's very selfish of him, and it shows a lot about his character. So what I would like to see out of the five potential candidates, I would like to see someone who is in touch with the people, mm -hmm. who don't mind, doesn't mind working with uh, the governor, whoever that governor may be, mm -hmm. um, making sure the schools are sufficient, making sure that everyone's children get quality education, not just their own. We should be concerned with every community, and, and also equalizing the playing field. Mm -hmm. Right now, it seems like the playing field is very uneven, and the concept of the mayor coming in and just pushing his own agenda, it seems like it pushes other people who are disenfranchised further back. And so I'm looking for a candidate uh, to come forward and basically uh, show that they care, and we can actually see a pattern of them putting in that effort to make this city a better place. It wouldn't just start now. Okay, and of course with President Trump, he's tweeted a lot of uh, negative remarks and a lot of racial remarks as well as his campaign and people following him in the 2016 general election cycle. So essentially, what, what do you want to see as in regards to going forward to 2020 as we you know, possibly might have another president or you know, continuation of his administration? What, do you, what would you want to see from that 2020 election cycle? Well, I'm just like how I feel about the gubernatorial race. I feel like right now we need fresh people. We need a new governor. We need a new president. We need a new administration that does not perpetuate racism, misogyny, does not, does not perpetuate fascism, all the, the things that ha that people feel like they're imprisoned. It's like being a part of the United States now is not an equal thing. Mm -hmm. Now you have to fit into a certain mold, and then if you speak up, you're considered a terrorist. Uh, how could our voices be something construed as terrorism? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and not only that, but even with the administration, it has to be replaced because they've embraced white supremacy. They talk about white supremacy, but nobody's ever said anything that it's like it shouldn't be here. But instead, we're going to focus on those people who stand up against it. So I'm looking forward to a new administration, and I hope we get a candidate that can be well-rounded enough to deal with every issue from health care to homelessness. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are so many different issues that we have never heard our president speak on, and it's really sad. So the same thing for the governor. I would like to see the governor replaced. Um, I do not believe he or the mayor will win their elections. I think that their track record has proven that they're not uh, equipped to be in those capacities that they try to function in. And I think there's so much inner fighting amongst them that right now their focus is not the people, and that's why they should be uh, out of those offices. Now, let's actually talk about the governor's race, because in 2018, uh, that's when the seat for that uh, office will be uh, up for a vote. So um, there is a primary for the Democrats, and Governor Bruce Rauner himself has spent a large portion of his money for his second term. What concerns and issues do you want to see addressed during this campaign for governor? Because there's five Democratic candidates right now. That's Steele Hardman, Bob Daber, uh, J.B. Pritzker, Chris Kennedy, and Senator Daniel Biss. I would like to see um, the issue of education be first and foremost. I do believe that somehow with the, with the governor being elected, he has not done much of anything um, in the wake of education. I think that the budget not being done is a clear indication that he is not capable of doing a budget. And I think that right now to not focus on having a budget for the state of Illinois is unreal. Um, it seems like uh, his focus is more on now being reelected. And you can't really say that you have a pattern of doing work in the state of Illinois or changing anything. You can't really look back at Bruce Rauner's legacy and say he's done something. Mm -hmm. And I think that says a lot about where he'll be when it comes to re-election. So he does have money, and, and I think having money has put him in a bad position because he came into the office with the wrong set of eyes, and it automatically was less eliminate anyone that needs any sort of help. So all the social services were affected. Um, look at these organizations that were servicing mental health, and now all of those things don't exist. Daycare, anything that really helped people kind of get to a successful place, he destroyed every program. And I think people are going to remember that, and I, I really hope they do. Mm. All right. Now, in regards to returning back to Chicago, uh, this is a situation that's affecting a lot of communities and families. 
there are schools within low-income neighborhoods that are being shut down and students are being put into overcrowded classrooms and the livelihoods of teacher are constantly at risk and under Mayor Emanuel he has shut down schools in low-income and minority communities now what is the long-term social impact and how has Black Lives Matter Women of Face addressed this issue so the long-term social impact is that children will not receive the proper education if they are in overcrowded classrooms. So we know that that will affect them in being prepared for high school and prepared for college. Um, the probability of someone getting the type of attention that they need uh, to excel in certain academics will be very slim if they don't have enough teachers and if the teachers are overworked and if the teachers are stressed out. Um, so I do believe that that will be something that has a long-term effect if we don't speak up. Black Lives Matter Women of Faith, we stand with the Chicago Teachers Union. We stand with them in the respect of making sure that these children should have access to quality education. They should have adequate books. They should have computers. And it should be the same type of education that is set for um, the children of the mayor. Because his kids go to some of the top schools in the city of Chicago, but they're also being paid by the same tax dollars, and that's un that's unequal. Right. How is it that we all pay the same taxes, but his children can go and benefit from another education level from different from a person who is in a, a less fortunate community? So I think the underserved communities, it's time for us to continue to speak up and make sure the parents are aware that they have a voice too. So that's what we try to do. We try to educate people mm -hmm. on what their options are and that they do have a voice and empower them to know that they can come together like they did for the city council recently. Now, there's another issue that's affecting a lot of low-income minority communities. In Pilsen and South Austin, as well as numerous other communities, uh, there is uh, large real estate developers that are moving in with the support of elected city uh, Chicago officials and Cook County officials. Uh, the result of this um, has basically led to uh, you know people being displaced. So what are the necessary uh, steps, really, real quickly, to basically have political pushback to stop gentrification? I think we need to galvanize. We need to get the people together who are affected by those communities. Um, when these real estate developers come in, and we need to stand up and basically voice our opinion to say this cannot happen. But we have to hold the aldermen accountable because many of the aldermen are approving these real estate developers. And if we don't know the role of an alderman, there's no way we can push back. So coming together collectively and sitting down to come up with an agenda is the way that we're going to stop these real estate developers from taking over these communities and pushing pushing people out. Now, two-part thing, uh, what do you want to say to people who are choosing not to be involved? And also, where can we find you and your group on social media? Those who are not choosing to be involved, I would like to say this. Don't wait until it affects you personally. Don't wait until uh, a social justice issue like mass incarceration or police brutality hits home for you. Yeah. Stand up with those mothers and fathers and, and all those people who are affected by uh, when, when acts of crime happen against their family members um, because it shows a level of compassion. Um, and so I would just like to say, you know, I would not want to stand next to somebody who has just gone through something. I would rather for them to just be out there because they're concerned, because the community is what matters. Right. Um, if people would like to get in touch with us, um, we are at, we're on Facebook, uh, BLM Women of Faith. That's mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter Women of Faith, but the letters BLM mm -hmm. and Carolyn J. Ruff and LaShawn Yvonne Trace. And we can all, we can be located on Facebook under those uh, letters. And once you reach out to us, you can message us and we can give you further information. And we have these and this information for our boycott. Mm -hmm. And the boycott is every day. And it's, we're out there every day. And it's however many people show up. It doesn't matter. One of us will be there. Well, that's a very good note to end it on. Uh, I just want to thank you, LaShawn Latrice, for showing up here at uh, Q4 Radio Station and being on Harlan's Media. Uh, I just wanted to say, if you want to support us, uh, check us out on Q4 Radio every Saturday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Peace. You're watching Hard Lens Media.